one bag of heroin can kill you and not only kill that person, but destroy that entire family and everything that was tied to them. And I am a uh, recovering alcoholic and drug addict. Grew up in, uh, in Chris Lake, Illinois, wanted to be a professional water skier, struggled with substance abuse, alcohol, cocaine for a number of years, in and out of recovery, but never grasped it. Uh, uh, started at 14, uh, first time in treatment at 21. Um, was a year clean and sober from 31 to 32 and uh, took a kid to Chicago to move out of his apartment. His roommate was doing heroin. Said, you wanna try a bag? I said, sure. Worst mistake of my life, took me down a 12 year rabbit hole to utter destruction. Uh, two stints in the Illinois Department of Corrections, eight overdoses, clinically dead three times, two heart attacks, lost millions of dollars, was very successful, but ultimately, uh, I'd overdosed while driving and hit two cars and almost killed four people. Prison saved my life. Uh, but in prison, my wife of 18 years divorced me, lost our beautiful house in foreclosure. My oldest son was in active addiction. That's where I truly grasped recovery. 13 and a half months later, I walked out. And then on my 21 month sobriety date, my 20 year old son succumbed to a heroin overdose. Nick, unfortunately, uh, followed in my footsteps. And when I got out of prison, he was in treatment for the sixth time, trying to get him on the right road. And uh, he walked out of treatment, 30 days later was back in jail, did 30, 45 days in jail, got out. I uh, talked to him, I said, Nick, come get some Narcan, reverses the effects. Don't worry, Dad, I'm not on that. And two days later, my former wife, Shannon, called me and said, Nick overdosed. We got to the hospital and Tim and Shannon Ryan here to see our son, Nick, he overdosed. And 30 seconds later, the chaplain walked out. Well, Nick and I were chaos agents together. Unfortunately, that's how we bonded when we were both active in our addiction. And then when I got out of prison, myself and my former wife were the only ones trying to help him. But Nick's ego was so big and I'm 20 years old. He had overdosed eight times and the ninth overdose killed him. And the misconception is you have to shoot heroin. My son had snorted two bags after being clean 50 days and ate his Annex bar. And when he was overdosed and the kids he was with knew he was overdosing and, and did nothing. They propped him on a sofa, went in the basement and did more drugs and came up an hour later and he was dead. I uh, started when I was 18 years old um, or even maybe a little before that using uh, prescription opiates or opioids, Vicodins and things like that. It can't be that bad, so I can, I can definitely beat it, you know. Getting ready to play college basketball at the time, and um, you know, so I was a good athlete and everything, and I thought, you know, if, if anybody can beat it, I, I would be one of the guys that could. So uh, I originally I signed to play basketball at uh, Adrian College and worked out with them the whole summer before my uh, um, between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college. Maybe even when I was 16 or 17, uh, you know, in the hallways of my school. Um, they would, you know, I had a couple of buddies that would mess around with uh, Vicodins and then pass out, you know, hand me a couple of Vicodins or something and, you know, just it came from friends so I didn't think anything of it, you know, and I didn't mind, you know, drinking or, or smoking pot at the time so, you know, I would take them and they would make me feel, you know, great. So I actually stopped, never really smoked pot, you know, too many times after that or, um, I actually continued drinking, but uh, I got in trouble for drinking a couple times, so then I would go to parties and take, uh, take uh, Vicodins or Percocets or things like that. Um, and then I had a good connection for uh, uh, Vicodins um, to where you know, I could get them frequently. And actually I, was di or I got uh, meningitis when I was uh, um, about 18 years old and I um, I uh, was on, in the hospital for a week and I was on morphine for a week and then when I left the hospital they gave me a prescription for about 60 or 90 Vicodins, I can't remember, but um, to go home with and uh, that basically got me hooked but I didn't think that it would happen to me and if I did quit cold turkey I'd be completely fine but that wasn't the case. I finally hit rock bottom when, uh, when I, was, um, I was still, I was doing heroin and um, I had uh, I had turned in my drug dealer uh, to actually quit, you know, to slam the door on uh, on him and my addiction, basically, to try to uh, 
you know, keep myself clean. I was open carrying it, thinking that I was lawfully carrying it right. But when you're in a vehicle, you, you have to have it in a lockbox. And so um, he uh, actually, the police think that he gave me a hot shot because he knew that it was me because it was, what I bought was so much less than what I normally had buy, would buy. And um, it made me uh, overdose so much. And uh, uh, the parking lot I was in, somebody called the police and the ambulance showed up and um, everything. And they caught me and charged me with four felonies um, or three felonies, I'm sorry. It was at that, that point in time, I was facing three to five years in prison. That I was homeless, uh, that I, as part of my using and my um, attempt at drug dealing um, as a way, a way and means to continue to use. I um, transported drugs. I did things that put myself in, in so much danger. When I look back at the, at the things that I did, um, I, I should be in prison had I, you know, um, I, but I, again, I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. I don't regret the things that I did. Um, it made me who I am today. It brought me to the place that I am today. I have a wonderful life today and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I had to go through all of that, I think, to get here. You know, we got clean together. We actually met in rehab. It used to be, it used to be a curse. It used to be when he wanted to stop, I didn't. And when I wanted to stop, he didn't. And now, we um, we really are each other's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's scary. We talk to our kids quite a bit. We used to think that our kids didn't know that we hit it quite well, um, and that wasn't the case. And we didn't really learn to the extent of what they knew until we got out and got clean, and they felt it was safe enough to talk to us about. Um, I think in our case, our using and them seeing that um, is quite a deterrent for them. So we have um, one daughter that's 19, and you know she's in college, and she seems very well adjusted. I would like to think that I would know the signs, um, but I also know that as a mother, you tend to overlook a lot of things. You you um, you leave that open to um, giving them the benefit of the doubt. So we talk to our kids quite a bit about using and not trying things, and that they. Um, are predisposed um, to this disease and that they don't have the privilege of trying things that we thought we did um, because of that. That um, their, their trying might not be, you know, it, it may only be one time. Um, we try to also keep them active um, and involved in seeing and helping other people. I hang out with everyone from the full IV kids who are considered very smart to athletics to anyone in, in school just to be, because they have to be. Uh, SAD was something that really struck me after we had an overdose in our school. It was something that I wanted to get attention to because it was on pills. I had a very uh, major surgery, so I had morphine, oxycodone, uh, Vicodin, pain reliever, uh, muscle relaxers, pain, everything. I had it all and it was really hard to almost get off of it just because it was something that was so helpful to me. There is a lot of drug action at our school. I hear everything. There's from, I know acid is getting big as it's very big at our school. Molly is big in certain areas like Ipsy and people hear that, people want to go there. There's uh, drugs like heroin that have been noticeable. I've heard someone call it dog food. So there's names for these that are getting popular as well. Everyone knows how to get around it. Everyone knows what to say, how to hide it, to do it at a, a random house. Like If you have a friend's house, they can go there, they can do that. They can get away with it, they can go home the next day, no one knows. You know, you're seeing a saturation of heroin, you're seeing prescription pill abuse, particular opiate-based painkillers. Um, we also have an uh, influx of cocaine. Uh, marijuana is also a large issue in the county. Um, 
just because of the way it's being manufactured. It's being turned into like an oil. They call it butter or shatter. Um, and they're also putting it into edibles. Taking heroin and mixing it with fentanyl, which is also a you know, painkiller uh, that is opiate based. And when you put those two substances together, you get a deadly cocktail. And that's why you're seeing these overdose deaths. What we've noticed over the past four to five years is a dramatic increase in heroin addiction. The majority of our crime is heroin related. And even though it may be home invasions or just theft, it, it all goes back to heroin addiction. And because people are stealing to be able to purchase it, um, it's so cheap nowadays. And it really truly is affecting the majority of what we're doing. But with heroin, this is, it's out of control. Um, the overdoses, we even have police officers now with kits to be able to bring someone out of an overdose because it's happening so often, nationwide, not just statewide. We've been dealing with this for years, and it, it seems like it's fell on deaf ears. Um, now people are, are, as more people are affected, it's, it's becoming more well known. Prevention is always the best form um, to fix a problem. We deal a lot with, with people seeking drugs and um, we're put in a really hard press because with the increasing criminalization and the emphasis on curtailing prescriptions, we now have situations where we can't even treat people appropriately who are in pain. And I may be hurting somebody in order to keep drugs off the street. There may be somebody who's coming on a Friday and they won't be able to see any doctor until the following Monday and yet I've been told to do no more than 10 pills. But we also have people that we jokingly say they need their, their uh, frequent flyer pin you know that they're now up to their 200th visit and the problem is it puts us in a situation of being the cop as well as the sympathetic doctor helping somebody and it, it, they, we have been pressed by both sides don't give too many drugs out don't leave somebody untreated pain is an emergency don't treat them after they leave let somebody else take care of it we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. It's not an immediate thing like on television. Somebody doesn't put a needle in your vein and you're immediately an addict. Um, narcotics need to be done repetitively and, you, and they need to be um, uh, reinforced. And the syndrome of addiction that results in withdrawal actually can take many days to weeks, even months for some people. Um, the pharmacology of any addictive substance is the more fast onset the drug is, so you have immediate gratification, and the faster the wear off is, the more likely that drug is to be repeated because you get, try to get that same benefit back. And so the pharmacology is fast onset, fast wear off, and then a need for repeated usage. It takes over a lot of the normal physiologic processes. Your gut slows down. You're no longer hungry. You are, become constipated. And for a lot of people, they don't care about that because there's no pain related to this constipation because the narcotic takes away the pain. Um, their skin receptors, they don't, they don't sweat as much. They're dry. Uh, they have a steady heartbeat. They become comfortable with everything that's around them. And, and it dulls their senses to all sense of pain. Um, take away the narcotic, everything turns back on. Their skin receptors become sensitive. The adrenaline that causes their heart to beat fast leaves them with a resting pulse rate well above 100. Uncomfortable, they're sweating. The goose flesh, the goosebumps you see on these people, they get nauseated, they vomit, their gut is now active, they're having to run to the bathroom 10, 12, 15 times a day, and they don't understand because they think they've got food poisoning. My son's an addict. Um, he's been addicted since he was 15 years old. Um, currently, he's served over a thousand days in jail. I noticed that when he was about 17, um, a lot of his started from uh, sports injuries, taking uh, prescription drugs, um, and then it just escalated from there, from marijuana all the way up to uh, the heroin route. When he turned 18, I really saw a change in him. Um, really not a whole lot of activity from him like he was because he's a really good basketball player and had scholarships to go to play basketball and uh, he just didn't want to do it anymore. He was uh, out late at night sleeping all day long, typical thing from a drug user that you see. And I'm sure as a dad, I know as a mom, I'd be frustrated. Get out of your list of things to do. Get out of bed. I mean I would be harping on him in that way. I'm sure that was a conversation in the house. I can't imagine it not. Right? right. In the beginning I was a little bit shocked. Um, couldn't believe it coming from a good Catholic family that my son's an, an addict. Um, had to really educate myself on everything. 
uh, went to a lot of meetings, worked a lot up in Jackson with Mike Hurst, who really uh, involved me a lot with what goes on with addiction. When he overdosed, um, was, me and Janae started the group here, and uh, when he overdosed, he, he was at home, um, didn't hear anything from him, he was taking a shower. Um, next thing I knew, I heard a large thud, and we had a sick dog at the time, so I thought that he was, uh, I thought it was the dog, so I was looking for the dog, um, went upstairs and found my son, um, blue in color, not breathing, no pulse. Um, immediately I called 911, did the best I could to revive him, um, did CPR on him, and um, got him breathing a little bit, got a pulse going. They came, gave him Narcan, and he was good. But um, the problem is, going to the hospital, um, he's just released right after that. That's a big problem in our society right now. How did that make you feel as a dad, having to give your son CPR? Um, cried. I, I relive that every single night. Um, as I tell my wife, I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, where's he at? I gotta find him. He's, uh, he's overdosed again. But just about every single night, I wake up, just reliving it over and over and over again. After the overdose, um, he's been, he went to rehab, got out, um, went right back to the same thing. And this has happened three or four times now. So, you know, talking to him, he always, he wants to kick it, or I believe he wants to kick it, um, but he just doesn't know how to get there. Um, so we've had conversations back and forth hundreds of times about this whole thing. Um, but I think now that he's in prison, he's realizing a lot more. Um, he's going to face a lot more time if he doesn't do the right thing this time. And uh, I think when he gets out, he's going to come help us. And he'll be a good help for the community here. Even though he is a drug addict, um, larceny from a person is always a big thing. And usually, most of the cases of larceny are from drug addicts. And my son was another one just like that. It's easier for a kid today in high school to get meth and or heroin or pain pills than it is a pack of cigarettes or a case of beer. Well, the average heroin addict goes to treatment six to eight times. And one time, you are absolutely in love with that drug. And then the monster's unleashed. That first bag of heroin I snorted, that was the, ah, this is what I've been looking for. But so quickly, it, it became an addiction, and, and you live to use and you use to live. But until I, I truly got sober in prison and, and I was in a drug treatment program and I really surrendered God, higher power, whatever, and plugged into recovery, all the years of my happiness I was looking for through drugs and alcohol were right here within me. I just didn't know how to tap into them. People look at addiction as, oh, you should have the willpower to quit. I wouldn't wish addiction on my worst nightmare. I had completely abused my family, you know, all of their trust, um, you know, my mom, dad, sister, uh, everybody in my family, you know, I had taken money from, um, you know, abused their trust, tell, lied to them, tell them where I was going, you know, where and I really wasn't going there, tell them I was going to quit when I really had no intention of quitting, made me uh, quit, finally uh, was facing prison time. Prescription uh, opioids can lead to heroin addiction, whether you you know it or not, or you believe it or not. It does happen, you know. And if it happened to me, it truly can happen to anybody. Future for Chris, uh, I'd like to think, um, as hard as it's going to be, I want to go back uh, to school and uh, become some type of a uh, substance abuse counselor or um, a recovery coach of some sort, or maybe. Um, run a uh, sober living environment, sober living house, or um, something like that to give back to the people in the city where I'm from, the addicts, um, you know, because they truly don't belong in jail, and um, to get as many heroin dealers off the street as possible. One of the benefits I get from um, going to the 12-step meetings and talking to other people is their experience, strength, and hope on how, how you do, how you stay clean with the help of, the, of others. Um, you know, I have a higher power and, you know, so that, that spiritual relationship 
that I've been given, um, you know, that helps. You know, I'm fortunate that my husband is also, you know, recovery um, oriented and knows um, how to talk to me about certain things. And, um, and, and so you pick up the phone, you call another addict when you don't know how to de deal with something. When you're not sure what your next step is, um, you know, it taught me how to have faith, how to not stress out about things and know that things are just going to work out the way they're supposed to. I think Lenaway is unique in the kind of collaboration that we have here. When, when we started talking about doing um, a ROSC, a recovery-oriented system of care, we already had the structure in place. We have a long history in Lenawee County about working together with the schools, the courts, the law enforcement, community mental health, Department of Human Services, medical providers. So we had that structure already in place. What we weren't doing before was using that same structure to address the problem of addiction. Making that decision to come in that first time is really, really difficult. And we want to be open. We want people to know that come in, we'll make it as easy for you as possible to get connected. We won't give up on you. We're going to walk right with you until you get what you need. I have a lot of confidence that we'll be able to keep moving forward on this. But, you know, despite problems with resources, there's never enough money. But we do it despite the amount of, of the lack of resources. We're going to be there. We're going to be there with each other, and we're going to be there for people who are in our community. Treating addiction, preventing addiction is all part of the community. We have to have the entire community involved in prevention and treatment of addictions to be successful, and that's what we see here. You see the huge cross-section of people in our community that are really dedicated to working with people with addictions. My favorite project in SAD is the drug take back. I want to get rid of all that and I hope other people get rid of it too because it almost becomes like a training wheels for you. I hope we do more with middle school because I think it will hit them the hardest on knowing these before they try it. If someone tries it and they say, yeah, that is how it feels and I like it, us telling them more facts isn't going to change it. If we tell the facts first, then that's going to say like maybe they'll be more scared to try it and hopefully they won't. enough resources around here in the county to uh, get information education so we um, Marv and I decided to start a group for parents of addicted kids or uh, friends relatives whatever just want to kill the stigma get parents more involved whether they have uh, kids or not aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, everybody. The teens, we have a lot of recovered addicts that come to us and help our group. Um, many of the parents who have lost kids already can help other parents who are going through the, the same issues. Uh, it's something that needs to be talked about. As Marv said, the stigma is the worst thing. HALO stands for Helping Addicted Loved Ones, comprised of adults, of parents, of people, ki kids that have died. Um, and you know they had nowhere to go. There, there are not that many groups that can offer condolence uh, counseling and whatnot. And parents are quite, quite mad because they have no place to go. They don't know where to go. They, you know, and some people just don't. They don't make it out of their um, grieving process. And so we've we've put a lot of parents to work and it has helped tremendously. The people in the community are going to be the ones that change the face of addiction, not the law enforcement or whatever. They need all the help they can get. I tell him I love him and um, Andrew is a, he's a very kind, sweet, caring kid and you would, you don't see that when he's high. Um, it's a total different person. It, it, you would think you're looking at the devil himself and uh, that's why so many people say they're just not your kids and it's true. Andrew's a very kind, very smart kid and I tell him I love him as if he was my own and we do as much as we can for him. How in the world do we get a, a, a grip on the medical industry to make sure that we don't have policies in place that almost mandate 
that if you're going to get a good evaluation, your patient will be pain free. As opposed to saying, let's get them well, let's help them understand that we may not take all of the pain away, but you will ultimately get through it and the pain will go. You don't have to have all this medication. And there will be, I'm certain, levels of funding uh, as we find out uh, that just because of definition of what we fund uh, in a medical issue um, uh, may not fit with this problem. And so there may be a need to look at, you know, if, if, if in fact um, a, an overdose situation and coming off of that is something that you can go through without seemingly a lot of funding and yet the pain that goes into that is discourages people from going through the withdrawal and in fact pushes them deeper. Maybe we'd better look at some type of grant program uh, that gives dollars to entities that are actually doing the work in the district and can show that they're doing the work and to expand those dollars by um, the, the, the uh, um, vocalization of the problem of showing the, the places that will care for them and then getting a community at large to understand Let's look at the truly where the heart is, uh, there will, the effort will follow uh, more strongly than even through legislative process, but their efforts can bring springboard us into the fray as well. This is all over. I'm on a task force that's led by a colleague of mine from New Hampshire. Um, it goes from, from the east coast, of course, all the way to the west coast. We used to think this flyover zone was somewhat free of that except in those communities. Now it's everywhere. And when we see in my district from Monroe and the trafficking that comes up from Ohio, from Toledo, passes through there, goes north to Detroit, goes uh, northwest uh, through Lenawee County to Jackson County, um, we know it's touching all areas. The same issues are in our neighborhoods. It's in your neighborhood. And uh, frankly, it's, uh, it's stealing the soul of our country. Get to the medical end of it and saying to our doctors, we want to find a way and take your advice on how we can um, authorize legislation, authorize policy that, that, that certainly encourages you to do a great job in caring for your patients, but does not put you in the trap that you have to make them pain free to the point that they ultimately have pain the rest of their lives and sometimes pain that brings them to their death because of opioid uh, abuse. Rhino is the only proactive police agency we have. And it's not really a police agency because it's a combination of officers from several units. Um, but they're the only ones who are proactively going out and searching for drug sales, drug use, um, not reacting after the crime has already happened. If you have insurance, sometimes the insurance companies don't want to pay for it. And we need, we're going to need some help with legislators as far as that goes as well. Understand this is a community problem. We're not going to arrest our way out of this. The law enforcement cannot fix it. We, we have to get to the root of the problem, and we've got to find ways to help people. We, they need to be truly rehabilitated and not just punished. Punishment's not going to fix this. We've got to help people um, because treatment is what's really needed. There is some available, but there's not enough. <laughs>